As you guys have probably noticed, chapter 23 is super long. I thought I'd spice up this lecture by just starting out telling you guys a story about a practical joke my friends and I used to do back in high school. What we used to do is we'd get groups of us together, or friends. We'd go to a fast food restaurant. We'd all quietly sneak into one of the bathrooms. Once we were all kind of crammed in there, on the count of three, all of us would scream together as loudly as we could. Now one time we did this on a big group date. We, we left one of our, our friends outside the restaurant filming it, staring through the front window of the restaurant. The funniest thing about it is the reaction of the customers who are inside. They're all looking around wondering <laughs> where the screaming sound is coming from. The other funny thing about that footage is the fact that even though my friends outside the restaurant are screaming was so loud you can still hear it. Go in the store and make idiots out of themselves. Ah! They're going... After you guys finish this, our second PowerPoint presentation from Chapter 23, I expect you to be able to do the following. Explain to your peers how thin layer chromatography works. Know how to synthesize amino acids using the four methods addressed in Section 23.6. Explain to your peers what a peptide bond is, what a peptide is, and what a protein is. Know how to synthesize peptides, as described in Section 10, Know how to determine a peptide's primary structure as determined in section or as described in section 13. And define the following terms, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. I also want you to know how to determine the amino acid sequence of simple peptides for problems that involve Edmonds reagent, trypsin, or chymotrypsin. And of special note are the sections that we'll be skipping, 7, 9, 11, and 17. Our first concept is this magical little thing called thin layer chromatography, or TLC. I sometimes jokingly tell my friends in research who are facing difficulties with identifying their compounds, you need to give your reaction a little more TLC. And what is TLC? Well, simply put, it's a technique that helps us to identify compounds of numerous different types. Here's how it works. We spot a diluted mixture of multiple compounds at the bottom of a plate right here. We then submerge that plate bottom into an organic solvent. We then let the solvent crawl up the front of the plate by capillary action. As it goes, it drags the different amino acids in our mixture up the plate and separates them according to their solubility in the organic solvent. So these three spots here were all three individual amino acids in this hypothetical example that were found in our original spot here. They get dragged up the plate by the solvent and they separate out according to their solubility in that solvent. The amino acid that's the most soluble in the organic solvent and hence the least polar moves the furthest up. The amino acid that is the least soluble in the organic solvent, and hence the most polar, stays closest to the bottom. So remember, organic solvents are nonpolar. So compounds that are very, very soluble in nonpolar solvents will go up the furthest. And compounds that are less soluble, are, or are hence more polar, will go up less. I hope that's clear. You're welcome to pause that and, and rewind it a couple times if you want. But here's the deal. We can use this technique to identify amino acids if we want. We can also use it to identify a whole host of different compounds as well. Let's take a look at a hypothetical example. Let's pretend that before we developed our plate, we suspected that our spot happened to have an amino acid in it, alanine. And so we happen to also have somewhere on our shelf a bottle of pure alanine that we purchased in the store. What could we do? We could co-spot at the bottom of the plate over here on, to the right a spot of alanine from our pure known sample. 
and develop it at the same time as our other amino acid mixture. Now if that spot moves up the plate by the same amount as one of the spots in the mixture, then we can conclude that the matching spot, this red one here in our mixture, is also alanine. Does that make sense? This enables us to use thin layer chromatography, or TLC, to identify compounds. So if I have a compound that I know, I can co-spot it on the plate, develop it up simultaneously with my mixture, and identify the corresponding spot for my mixture as being the same compound. I hope that makes sense to you. The bottom line is this. TLC separates compounds by solubility. The least polar compounds move up the plate the furthest, and the most polar compounds move up the plate the least. So now we move on to reactions. Are there ways to organically synthesize amino acids? You bet. Here are the ones that I expect you to know. First, you can synthesize amino acids by using the hell wolhart zelinsky reaction, which we discussed first in Chapter 19, followed by treatment with ammonia. Here's how that works. You guys may remember that if I begin with a carboxylic acid or another carbonyl containing compound, and I treat it with bromine and water or bromine and acid, I can selectively bromine the alpha carbon. Now it turns out for carboxylic acids, you uh, often have to add phosphorus tribromide and then quench with water. This is called the hell volhard zelinsky reaction. If you react this intermediate with ammonia, it does a substitution reaction to give you this product, which is an amino acid. Hence, we've just learned one way of organically synthesizing an amino acid. Let's learn another way. Reductive amination. We first discussed this back in chapter 18, and you might remember me telling a humorous anecdote or two about it. If you start with this type of compound, which is an alpha-keto carboxylic acid, that is, a carboxylic acid that has a ketone at the alpha carbon, if I treat that with excess ammonia, what occurs is this oxygen gets replaced with a nitrogen, forming an imine. Nitrogen, which is doubly bonded to the carbon, can then be reduced using hydrogen, gas, and palladium carbon to give me this product, which is an amino acid. Now there is an even more efficient way to synthesize amino acid, and that's by doing a combined malonic ester slash Gabriel synthesis. We've talked about these individual reactions in these chapters right here. How can we combine them? Well, if we take a deprotonated potassium thalimid, shown here, and react it with this type of compound, an alpha bromomalonic ester. So once again, this is the compound that we use in the Gabriel synthesis. If I treat that with this, which has a bromine in between, a diester, it's called a malonic ester, what will occur is the negatively charged nitrogen We'll do an SN2 displacement at this alpha position, kicking off the bromide. That gives this intermediate. At this stage, I introduce my base. And actually, I have the, this base, which remember has to be matching with the ester group. The base is in here the whole time. The base now deprotonates this alpha hydrogen, thrusting the electrons into that carbon to give this negative charge. You'll notice this negative charge is stabilized by resonance into two carbonyl groups. At this stage, I introduce an alkyl halide that has whatever R side chain I want to eventually have end up in my amino acid. SN2 displacement gives me this. I've now alkylated the alpha carbon. Now what I do is I take this compound and react it with aqueous acid, and it hydrolyzes off this thalimid. Le uh, letting it depart as phthalic acid, I get CO2 byproduct, and this nitrogen is left as a free protonated amine. I've now effectively synthesized an amino acid. You're welcome to look at this more closely, keeping in mind the fact that you will be asked questions about it in class.